The Honda Center in Anaheim, California has hosted some of the most important events in mixed martial arts history and after tonight it can add the return of John Jones to its illustrious resume. Hello again everyone, I'm Mario Hawani standing outside the pond here in SoCal alongside our own Mark Ramundi, UFC 214 has just wrapped up and in the main event we saw the return of John Jones. He is now once again the light heavyweight champion of the UFC. He finished Daniel Cormier in the third round. It all started with a left head kick and then eventually some ground and pound. A knockout for John Jones six and a half years after he became the youngest champion in UFC history. Once again, now he is the reigning champion in the 205 pound division. There's so much to discuss as far as UFC 214 is concerned. Three title fights on this card, but we would be remiss if we don't start with John Jones. What did you think of the performance? Were you impressed? Were you surprised that he won in the fashion in which he did? I'm not surprised that he won, certainly, because I, I did pick him the, fashion. the other day. The fashion that he won, I think that it was a very interesting fight. I thought it was very, very close heading into that third round. I had Cormier up two rounds. I know that the scores were kind of all over the place looking online. Uh, one of the judges even had Jones up two rounds. I disagree with that. I thought Cormier won at least one of those those first two rounds. And the finish was... It was, it was like John Jones has so many ways to hurt you. He has so many weapons, and the head kick just got Daniel Cormier tonight. There were, there were kicks to the obliques, there were kicks to the body, and the, and the kick to the head. That was the one night that got Cormier, and that kind of led to, led to the finish. Yeah, it was a really, um, it was a varied attack. It was a spread out yeah. attack. The head, the body, the leg kicks were definitely the most mm. effective of them all. I thought Cormier, as you mentioned, fought a very strong yeah. first two rounds. It was a much different pace than the first fight back at UFC 182. I thought Jones won the first. I thought Cormier won the second. Of course, it ended in the third. But overall, I was really impressed early on with Daniel Cormier. He was a lot more patient. He was landing big shots. Mm -hmm. In fact, early on, he punched Jones so hard that his mouthpiece flew yeah. out. So it, it, was, it was going well for him. But then Jones found his opening. Did you think Jones was not looking like himself or did you think that he was just fighting the right kind of fight and eventually he would you know he would be able to pick his shots in other words do you feel like he lost a step because of the layoff or because of any other reason I don't think so it's so hard to say because look if we're saying that John Jones lost a step we're not giving Daniel Cormier enough credit I think I'm not gonna say John Jones lost a step I'm gonna say that Daniel Cormier came to fight tonight and looked very, very good in those first two rounds. I don't think that was because John Jones is not the same guy that we saw back then. I'm going to give credit to Daniel Cormier for being an improved fighter, better than he was two years ago in, in 2015 in that fight. So I'm, I'm going to say it's, impo it's impossible to know for sure, but I think John Jones was, was very similar to the guy that, 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 we, all, that we all know. What did you think of the stoppage? Was it late? I mean, it was. Pr I would have been comfortable with it stopping earlier. It's tough to say. It's a title fight. I know Big John likes to let title fights, especially big high-profile fights, uh, he likes to give the guy a chance to, to show that, that he's still in the fight. I would not have, I would not have been upset if, if he had stopped it uh, a shade earlier. For the UFC, was this the best case scenario? I think in a way, a way it is. I mean, it's tough to say. Long term, probably. Short term, man, that trilogy fight would have been pretty amazing if they were 1-1, one -one. If, if Cormier had won tonight. And they, and they probably do an immediate third fight, that would have done huge numbers. But I think long-term, John Jones is a bigger star than Daniel Cormier. In the two years that Cormier was the champion, his pay-per-views did okay. They didn't, they didn't do amazing. They didn't do terrible. They, they didn't do amazing either. I think there's more potential for John Jones to be, to be a bigger star and, and to kind of ca carry that torch. And plus, as, just far, as far as the sport goes, people know him as, the, as one of the greatest of all time, probably the greatest of all time, and now he, he continues to carry that, carry that mantle couple of really nice moments afterwards. First, when Dana White put the belt around Jones's waist once again, he was very emotional. Yeah. Uh, he went down on his knees, was tearing up, put his, his face in his hands. You could tell how much this meant to him. And yesterday we saw the emotion when he returned, when he stepped on the stage to do the fake weigh-in. He was very emotional as well. But even, even nicer than that, and, and even more refreshing than that, was what he said about Daniel yeah. afterwards. Yeah. At the end of UFC 182, he did the DX crotch chop. Mm -hmm. He said he hoped that Cormier was crying. He was not remorseful at all about any of yeah. the things that was said. In fact, he was kicking a man while he was down. This time, he was saying things like, you know, I really respect Daniel Cormier, and I look up to him, and, you know, he's a role model to me as a father and as a human being, and 
telling people that this man was not a paper champion and that he should be applauded, yep. that he's nothing to be ashamed of, even went up to Cormier afterwards and gave him a kiss on the head. That that really warmed my heart because we all love rivalries and that's really what intrigued mm -hmm. us about this, you know, this duo. But to see them kind of bury the hatchet like that, and I know Cormier was not really in the state to do so, but for Jones to go out of his way and do that, I thought was really nice on his part and, and showed yeah. maybe a maturation in his character. Without a doubt, and I think that was the right move, I really do, because after the first fight, tensions are still running high. You beat a guy twice. I think that's pretty definitive. I think that in, in some ways, at least this portion of the rivalry, maybe the entire rivalry is probably over. Would I hate to see a third fight? No, but I think for the time being, it's probably over, and, and that's the right way to end it. And I think even more important than what he said, I feel like he meant it. I, yeah, I really yeah. feel like it came off sincere. Son Jones doesn't always come off sincere, as we Great know. Great point. Yeah. I, I feel like that was I feel like that was legit, and he even said in the press conference, I I've been feeling this for a long time. Not gonna say it obviously because he doesn't like the guy. I mean, you can not like someone but also respect them. And I think that he he was honest in how he felt about Daniel Cormier, the man, and Daniel Cormier, the champion, over the last two years. And that was that was refreshing, and it's a new layer of John Jones that yeah. maybe we haven't seen that much of in in the past. In his defense, he did say something along these lines at the media day on Thursday that he thought he was a good person yeah. and you know that he wasn't going to stick it to him if he won, that he wasn't going to kick him while he's down, and he certainly lived up to his word. So I thought that that was very nice. Now, also very noteworthy was the last thing John Jones said on the mic, which was, "Hey, Brock Lesnar, you know, essentially come and yeah. get it." Afterwards, Brock Lesnar telling the Associated Press, be careful what you wish for, young man. What did you make of that whole exchange? Oh, it's great. I, I, you love I, this. I love it. That was, that was so perfect. I mean, it was, uh, he, he closed the book on the Cormier rivalry, and he opened the book a little bit further on the Lesnar thing. This week it was talked about how serious it was. I don't really know. Now it seems like it could be a real thing, maybe not in, in, in the short term but sometime we'll explain to people year. why yeah. this can happen yeah. in November for example tell people what sure, sure. Lesnar is facing yeah so it, it can't happen in November because Brock Lesnar is still suspended by USADA and he retired uh, earlier this year I'm not exactly sure when January it was January right? January yeah. January and when you retire you leave the USADA drug testing pool and if you're suspended and you leave the USADA drug testing pool it means your suspension is frozen. It doesn't. The, the time does not continue taking off that suspension. So Lesnar will have to get back into the pool and serve out the remaining six plus months of his suspension before he can fight again. And there's no exemption for that. It's something that he has to do. And he's not in the pool right now. He, he I know there were reports last week that he was in the pool. Those are not true. He's not in the pool, according to the UFC. Jeff Nowitzki. And we'll know if he's in the pool because you saw the updates there. There data every week. So if Lesnar's in the pool, we'll find out because it's public as far as USADA is concerned. So if this fight is going to happen, it won't happen until 2018, you know, late winter, early spring. Okay, so let's put Brock to the side for a second. Yeah. Obviously, the suits over at WME, they'd probably love to do this. Uh -huh, I yeah. mean, this would do, Dana White, for the record, said afterwards that this is trending. This show, mm -hmm. 214, over a million buys. That would be a huge success. I don't think any of us predicted that going into the yeah. fight based on yeah. the buzz, but there seemed to be a great amount of buzz, and yeah. celebrities were here, and people were tweeting about it who don't usually tweet about MMA, and these little things sure. are kind of indicators. Lesnar versus Jones would be huge box office for them. There's, there's, yeah, there's no doubt about yeah. that, but it's not on the table right now. It's not on the cards. So to me, there seems to be three options for John Jones next. Stipe Miocic in this yeah. sort of super heavyweight, uh, super fight, excuse me, uh, at heavyweight, where John Jones tries to become a dual champion like Conor McGregor. Then there's obviously Alexander Gustafsson. In my opinion, the best fight in UFC history, first fight at UFC 165. Yep. They've been teasing each other. This fight has been, you know, they tried to rebook it, it didn't come to fruition for various reasons. Alexander Gustafsson calling out Jones afterwards yeah, on Twitter yeah. saying, stop calling out retired people, mm -hmm. come fight me. And then there's Volkan Uzdemir, who's kind of the wild card if maybe the stars don't align, knocks out Jimmy Manoa tonight, has gone now 3-0 in 2017. Prior to the knockout, had a knockout over Misha Serkinov in seconds. I mean, this guy, I don't even know what to make of the, <laughs> the Swiss fighter Volkan yeah. Uzdemir. The guy is just on an amazing run. Of those three options, which do you like best? Which do you think is the one that makes the most sense and the most probable for John next? Probably the second one, probably the middle one, Gustafson. I think that there's unfinished business there, and I think both guys feel that 
even leading into this fight, people were talking about Danny Cormier being John Jones' big rival, and John, Jones always corrects people and says, actually, the fight that I had to dig deep for the most was actually Alexander Gustafson. I think that there is a storyline there. I think that there is a marketability there, and, and Gustafson is on a, on a bit of a roll. He's yeah. still, it's a legitimate title fight. Obviously, he, he's, I think he merits a title shot for what he's done in, in his last few fights. Stipe Miocic, you know, I would not hate that fight. I would like that fight. I think that would be a, a, a great fight. It doesn't seem like John Jones wants that fight. He made the point today at the press conference that he's not a big name. You know, Miocic is not a big name. He, this is not a guy that uh, may bring in the, the, the fans. It might not be a big drawing fight compared to someone like Brock Lesnar. And I think maybe even Gustafson would be a bigger draw just because of that history with him and Jones. Yeah, that's the fight I want to see as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I would love to see him. He says that there's not a lot left for him at 205. Volkan is, is, is a guy now. He's a fresh he's a face and he's knocking people out in seconds. So how could you ignore him? Um, I want them to take a very, very long break. But I wouldn't hate at some point, maybe the back end of 2018, seeing Cormier Manoa, considering the yeah. the rivalry that was mm -hmm. built there. But we can worry about those guys uh, later, and I'll ask you a little more about Volkan in a second. Let's yeah. move along to the co-main event now, because there's so much to talk about here. Tyron Woodley defeats Damian Maya. Most people had it five rounds to none. Some maybe gave Maya one round. It was an interesting fight early on, and then the fans really got mm -hmm. frustrated, and there were loud boos at the end of the fourth and fifth rounds. What did you make of it? Dana White very critical of yeah. Woodley. Once again, Woodley forced to defend himself, dominant but not spectacular and flashy. What did you yeah. make of the fight? I, you know, it's 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 a really hard one because it wasn't a great fight. I think we can all I think we can all admit that that was not. A great fight, not a good fight. It was, it was a fight. There was a lot of inactivity during the fight, but I can't begrudge Tyron Woodley. I just cannot find myself begrudging Tyron Woodley for doing this because Damian Maya, we've just, we just saw him reel off seven straight wins against top tier competition. He makes everyone look bad on the ground, and Tyron Woodley was able to stuff 24 takedowns out of 24 takedown attempts, and he executed the perfect strategy. He, he, he had a strategy going in, he had a game plan, and he executed it to a T. And he won the fight. And at the end of the day, I know that I say it's entertainment all the time. It is entertainment, but it is still a sport, too. There are some, there, very, very much so. You've got to win. If you're the champion, you want to keep the belt. And Tyron really did, did that. And he did that against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson in his last fight, too. So I have a hard time begrudging him for this. Do I wish it was more exciting? Sure. Do I wish he took some more risks? Of course. Like Dana White said, you know, no risk, no reward. But... End of the day, Tyron Woodley wins the, keeps the title, wins the fight, and beats a guy who is on this incredible run who is one of the best jiu-jitsu specialists in the history of the sport. Yeah. So I, I have a hard time begrudging him for that. I thought it was a tale of two fights. I thought the first three rounds were fascinating. Yeah, I agree. Um, in the end, Woodley stuffed, what, 20-plus takedowns? 24. I mean, he's making a guy who looked absolutely dominant, who was not even mm -hmm. landing punches and yes. submitting some of the very best at 170. What he's doing is fighting some of the very best Woodley Guys who are on rolls, Wonder Boy, mm -hmm. Robbie Lawler, um, um, Damian Maya, and completely nullifying them. I mean, that, there's something to be said for that. Back end, maybe he could have taken more risks, but I don't think it's fair to browbeat him or to <laughs> insult him yeah. or anything of that nature. You know, it's unfortunate for Maya. You know, he was hit with that punch. His eyes swelled up. He says afterwards that yeah. there were no broken bones. But you have to think that, A, that bugged him. And, B, he made a great point. He only had five weeks to prepare for this. And he has been going to Hoboken, New Jersey, to mm -hmm. train at Edge Wrestling for, you know, the, the past seven fights. Um, you know, he came in studio uh, MMA hour because he was in New Jersey mm -hmm. prior, you know, to, to his, his last fight. I mean, this is a guy who has been taking his wrestling very yeah. seriously. And you wonder if he had the opportunity to travel to the States. Mm -hmm. Who knows if the fight is different? But alas, he took the fight and he's not making any excuses. I just hate the idea of criticizing a champion who completely nullified a guy who was looking that good sure. and, and making him feel ashamed of his performance. I get the fans booing him. Mm -hmm. I get the fans being upset. They pay good money. They want to see fireworks. Yep. I get it. But I think we sometimes have to take a step back and, and once again remind ourselves that this isn't Rock'em Sock'em Robots, yep. that these guys are ultimately trying to win because if you keep winning, you keep getting paid more, provide for your family. I don't think he's being treated very fairly here. Yeah, on top of that, he made a good point. He's not getting hit. Yeah. This is a, this is a very dangerous sport. A sport with concussions and CTE uh, effects later in life that 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 can really debilitate someone and he's fighting a style that's he's not getting hit. He's not taking damage and he's making money and he's keeping the belt and the belt means more money, the belt means more Reebok pay, you know, pay. 
I mean, again, I can't, I cannot begrudge the guy. And so, if the boos weren't enough, if the the, the criticism <laughs> wasn't enough, the GSP fight that he was told he was going to get was now taken away. And we have to be honest. I mean, I've been saying it time and again. I always believed that Bisping GSP was the fight that they were going to make. And afterwards, Dana White said that that is the fight that they mm -hmm. are going to make. So both GSP, who I spoke to briefly after the Woodley fight, told me he still wants Bisping. Pretty much Bisping or nothing. We know Bisping wants it. Dana White says afterwards, fifth round, he decided that he was <laughs> going to turn that ship that sailed a couple of days ago, bring it back. And I'm told, according to a very, um, a very strong source with knowledge, with knowledge of the discussions, that it's going down at MSG hmm. November 4th, which is what we always thought was going to be the date for this fight. How do you feel about that? That basically, a couple of days ago, he's told, literally in front of all of us, you're getting this fight if you win, and now he's told you didn't do enough to get the fight. To quote the poet, Nate Diaz, okay. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Yeah, you know the rest. Uh, yeah, this is, of course, that was always going to be the fight. Woodley even knew it in the press conference. Dana White said the ship has sailed, and Woodley was like, all right, we'll, yeah. we'll see. Even he knew that there was a very good chance that if he beat Maya, he was not going to fight GSP even even still. It's fine. You know, I, I didn't love the fight when they booked it the first time around. At this point, Let's I don't... just get it over with, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if it makes sense, but there is, there's something to it. I, I kind of like the the dynamic between the two of those guys in the, from the press conference that was months ago at this point when they had the, the press conference. So I'm fine with it. I think that it's a good, I mean, it, it isn't the number one contender. There's an interim champion in Robert Whitaker that Bisming is not fighting. I guess he's injured. But it is a bit of a money fight. I think that there's intrigue there. GSP's comeback is, of course, going to do very well. Bisming is a great foil because he will talk trash. Whatever, it's fine. They need a big deal for the second MSG show. Yep. GSP's return, I think, is a big enough mm -hmm. deal. Um, so let's move along now to the third title fight on the card. Chris Cyborg is now the yeah. new UFC women's featherweight champion. Finally, after all these years, she gets that gold. Nice scene as Dana White, who has been critical of mm -hmm. her in the past, um, puts the belt around her waist. And she was, very, you know, she was very touched by the moment, and she certainly deserves it. What was the bigger story, in your opinion? And oh, by the way, she wins in the third round. She wins via TKO. Yes. So that was the first time in four years that she saw the third mm -hmm. round. What was the bigger story, in your opinion? Cyborg winning the way she won, or Tanya Evinger's toughness, taking all those shots, continuing to come back, and even at the press conference, being utterly disappointed in herself that she yeah. couldn't even make it to five rounds. She was really upset that she couldn't even do that, in addition to not winning. What do you think was the bigger story out of that fight? I still think Cyborg winning is the bigger story because of the history there with the UFC, how long she's kind of tried to get in their good graces, you know, so to speak. And it seems like they're going to try to do right by her now and, and commit to her and promote her as the champion. I hope so because being here all week in Orange County, granted she is from this, this area, she's a big star. I, I, really, I really feel like she is someone the UFC should get behind in a, in a world where Conor McGregor, we don't know what's happening with him. We think he'll come back. Ronda Rousey's gone. Who are the big stars? John Jones is back now. That's great. GSP may be coming back. But guess what? Chris Cyborg is a big star. She's someone they can build around. If they promote, she's got, I mean, just show her highlights. She, she, is, she, just, she just smokes people. She just, she just smokes other women. I think she's still the big story. And also the fact that she's a much better technical, tactical, fighter, smart fighter than she was years ago. I mean, she's combined that aggression and power with really incredible technique now. It's, it's, it's incredible to watch. So the interesting thing is her contract is up in October and she's sort of not committal. Dana White was kind of playing coy about the whole thing, but he knows, he knows it's up and they're going to have to pay her and they want to keep her and they yeah. should keep her because she is a star and she is marketable and she yeah. does have that it, it factor and she's a superstar and clearly the fans like her now yeah. a lot more than they did just a couple of years ago. She's come a long way as far as her popularity is concerned. Let's say they do sign her. Let's say they figure it out at some point. Who does she fight at 145? What makes sense? Well, there's really only one fight that I think makes sense right now, and it's Holly Holm. I think that that is the fight to do. Dana White said he saw Holly Holm in the back tonight, and she said she was interested. Of course, there will have to be some monetary discussions with Lenny Fresca as Holly Holm's manager. But to me, that's the fight, right? If, if, if Cyborg does re-sign with the UFC, Holly Holm was in the first women's featherweight title fight, lost that fight in controversial fashion, came back and, and won against Petra Goahea, was that only last month? Not that long ago. So she's she got a win under her belt. She came back from those three straight losses. 
Cyborg Home is a fantastic uh, matchup as far as styles go. A great striking matchup. Holly Home is still a big star, yeah. by the way. She's still someone uh, people like to see. I think that, that could be a pay review main event in my eyes. I agree. Cyborg fought a, a tactical fight. She looked very good. She was patient. But I can't say enough about Evinger's yeah. toughness. I mean, some of those shots were painful to watch, <laughs> and she just kept on coming. So I'm really excited to see her at 135 now yeah. in her more natural weight class. And um, it's great to see her finally in the UFC. Uh, quickly before we go, Robbie Lawler and Donald Cerrone, I think, lived up to the hype. It mm -hmm. was a fun fight. Unfortunate that we don't get the two extra rounds because uh, it's a perfect five-round main event fight. But uh, back and forth they went. They fought in a phone booth for the most part in the pocket. A, did you enjoy the fight because the expectations were so high? Right. I feel compelled to ask. And B, who'd you score it for? Yeah, it was a great fight. I saw some people saying that you know it didn't live up to expectations on, online. I think that's crazy. I think both guys really fought their butt off. I think that I, I too wish that was that was two more rounds because that would have that could have been. It was a great fight. It could have been like an epic fight if it was if it was a five rounder possibly. I had it for Lawler. I thought that was a good score. I thought that made sense. Lawler, first round, third round. Cowboy definitely won the second round. There's no doubt about that. But I think Lawler did enough. Landed the harder shots in the first and third. And speaking of Lawler, the interesting thing is if Woodley doesn't get mm -hmm. GSP, which obviously doesn't look like it's going to happen, Dana White specifically mentioned Robbie Lawler as a potential opponent for Mr. Woodley. Yes. Do you like that fight a year after they fought? Lawler 1-0 and now since losing the belt. Does that make sense to you? It does. It makes sense. I think that there are. And it's weird because it, that is an amazing division. It's it's maybe the best division in the UFC. But there isn't any standout number one contender type names yeah. right now. And Robbie Lawler, I think, is as good as anybody. He lost quickly. It was it was a one punch knockout. He was he wasn't a long term champion, but he had title defenses. He, he was someone that people felt was a was a good champion, a legitimate champion. I don't see any problem running that one back. I love the Volkan Uzdemir story. Knocks Amazing. out Jimmy Mano in a matter of seconds. Who saw that coming? I mean, completely bullied him, and 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 he has this like, he has this amazing power that you just would never have guessed he possesses. It's Great. so much fun. He's got this calm, cool demeanor. He's got a, a a new nickname, No Time, because he says that in Switzerland watches are popular, and he finishes guys in a matter of seconds. So that's why he was pointing to his fake watch. I mean, this is brilliant. His 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 name in Turkish means volcano, and he's very much like that, how he erupts. There's a lot going on here with Volkan Uzdemir. If he doesn't get a title shot next, and he said he wanted that, but I yeah. think it's a long shot with Gustafsson, anything makes sense for him, in your opinion? Jeez, I, I don't I know. I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah, well, it's crazy, because Volkan Uzdemir in February was going to fight for Titan FC. He was he was he had a fight signed. I think it might have even been on the prelims. It wasn't even it wasn't the main event of the, of the Titan card and they uh the UFC needed someone to fill in against Ovin St. Pru and they called up the Titan guys uh you know Jeff Aronson and Lex McMahon and uh they actually let I mean he was going to fight like the next day yeah. for, uh and and on a Friday and he was going to fight on Saturday and and they let Vulcan sign with the UFC on short notice to fight in, in uh you know for against Ovin St. Pru and bail on the Titan fight so the guy was, I mean, it's just crazy how now he was there in February and now he's knocking out Jimmy Manuel in 42 seconds. Yeah. Here, I don't, I don't know what is next for the guy, but you got to keep your eyes on him because, yeah. like you said, no time. Cesaro better watch out. He's not the Swiss Superman any longer. Vulcan wow. Ozdemir is, is the guy. Rumble Johnson was in the back right after the win. He was glowing about his work mm -hmm. ethic. It's just a great story when these guys yeah. come out of nowhere, and especially in a division that was lacking some depth. All of a sudden, we've got something in the uh, the Swiss no time. I don't know. There's like eight different nicknames. Volcano, Uzdemir, Ozdemir, Volkan. Just a great story. Um, form, all right. form Volkan. Exactly. Well said. A lot of other great performances. You had Aljamain Sterling with a win oh, over yeah, Henan Burrell. Ricardo Lamas with a fantastic uh, performance against one Jason Knight. Jason Knight just would not quit, would not go away, just kept going, kept going. Eventually, Lamas finished him. Brian Ortega with the great third round submission against Hinata Moicano. Any other performance you want to talk about before we go? I, all, all of those. Brian Ortega four straight third round finishes are yeah. you kidding me like how, who does that that's yeah. impossible no one ever had three straight and now he's got four straight i don't know how the guy keeps doing it he looks fantastic his hair looks amazing i mean you love his they hair. gotta get behind they gotta get behind brian ortega he's a, he's a local guy here like the crowd really liked him aljamain sterling look that fight was at 140 pounds and people said it this favored Henan burrow because 
he, they didn't make him go, go all the way down to 135. This, this favored him. Guess what? Aljamain Sterling came out with the biggest performance and the, and the biggest win of his career. Thought he looked great. You do not want that guy on top of you or on your back. He's, yeah. He gets a very dominant ground game. Really fun card. Great. It lived up to the hype. Yes. And uh, very good to hear that it's actually trending in the right direction as far as pay-per-view buys are concerned. We were worried that people would stop buying pay-per-views. <laughs> um, and I think the owners of the UFC are probably a little more worried than us. But <laughs> it's, it's good to see that the fans still care about big shows. This arena right here has hosted Penn Hughes, Kane against JDS1, the two Fedor fights in Affliction, Rousey, Carmouche, and now it can add, like I said, another great fight, Jones, Cormier, too. I thought that lived up to the hype. Maybe we didn't think it would end that way, but boy, oh boy, was it fascinating theater for two and a half rounds. Congratulations to John Jones, who is once again the UFC light heavyweight champion, and congratulations to Chris Cyborg on becoming the new UFC women's featherweight champion. Also, of course, to Tyron Woodley for retaining his welterweight title. All right, we are done from here in Southern California. Again, thank you so much for watching our coverage all week long from Los Angeles to La Mirada to Cerritos to Anaheim. It was a little tour of SoCal. Now it is time for us to say goodbye. Off to New York, MMA Hour on Monday. Much to discuss as well, but we shall say goodnight from outside the HANA Center. For Esther, Casey, Mark, I'm Ariel again. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you Monday for the MMA Hour.